All right, y'all turn to um, Psalm 78. We're going to continue on with this same thing, but we're going to switch gears a little bit with it and talk about it in a more practical manner. Psalm 78, all the way down to verse 70. Now, this is um, about David here. Watch what it says. <clears throat> it's actually a, a psalm of Asaph, but watch what he says about David, verse 7. He, God, chose David also, his servant. Did God choose David, or did David choose God? God chose David. Okay. Was David even looking for God? No. no. He was a young, young boy taking care of sheep. He chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. Folks, he took a shepherd and made him a shepherd over an entire nation. Now God did this. Imagine God is the potter and David's the clay. What did God desire to mold David into? His servant. His servant a king. Folks, he picked David when David was green behind the ears. Or wet behind the ears. A green... Up. Every time I'm trying to say something clever, uh, uh, but um, he he chose David, didn't he? Yeah. Now, did he mold David into exactly what he needed? Yes, he did. Did David do anything, folks? David opposed God and stood in the way all the time. Read it. Did David turn over? Was there a day when David just said, "That's it, Lord, my life's yours," and live in sinless perfection? Mm -hmm. No. David got in the way constantly, but was God able to use David? Yes. What was David that God could use? He knew, he knew what he was and had faith. He knew he wasn't trustworthy. You know what David said about himself? He said, I was conceived in sin. Not I was born in sin, I was conceived in sin. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yep. Why was David conceived in sin? Because his parents were sinners. So what do they conceive? A sinner. What's born? A sinner. What lives? A sinner. What dies? A sinner. What we're talking about is a new creature. Don't ever buy into this reformation. You cannot reform the flesh. It's corrupt and it dies. It, you've got to have regeneration. Something new, a brand new life starts and grows right alongside the old one. Now, he took David, a shepherd, and made him a shepherd of an entire nation of people. And what I want to do is just look at a, a few of these, and we're going to take Peter for an example. But think about Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John. He took fishermen and turned them into fishers of men, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Did Peter oppose him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Peter's yeah. constantly yeah. hard-headed yeah. Peter standing in the way, wasn't he? Yeah. Even after salvation, Peter opposed him. Yeah. yeah, folks, Peter was a sinner. But did God do what he wanted with Peter? Yes. yes. Yeah, how about, uh, let's see, um, how about farmers? He called a bunch of farmers and turned them into sharecroppers for him, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He took a bunch of farmers and made them go out and gather in his fruit, didn't he? Uh, how about Matthew, a tax collector? Matthew's a tax collector. How did Matthew come to the Lord? The Lord walked by one day and looked at him and said, Come, follow me. And what did Matthew do? He got up and left everything and followed him. Now someone might say, <clears throat> Incredible conviction on Matthew's part. Alone. Come on now, an IRA tax collector, he was a crook. Have you ever seen a crook leave all their crookedness and go to... No. What Matthew did was, the Spirit called him and he went, didn't he? So then when Matthew was a collector of taxes, Jesus Christ calls him and begins reforming him and turns him into someone that's going to go out and collect his own jewels, didn't he? Ain't that what Matthew did? Yeah. All right, how about, uh, let's see. Ah, Luke. Did he take a doctor and turn him into somebody that was going to go out and heal souls? He did, didn't he? I don't care what it is a person has done for a living. You can make the application that you can do that in God. Folks, whatever you do for a living, you're only doing it because in the plan of God, you were allowed to do it. How about a tent maker named Paul? He became the architect of God's own house, didn't he? He said he was a master builder. 
I don't mean he was the first, and I don't mean he planned it. I mean that man knew more about the construction of that house than any other fleshly individual, didn't he? So did he take a man that was accustomed to building tents and send him out to build the house of God? Mm -hmm. He did, didn't he? Well, whatever you do for a living, I don't care what it is, you, you can claim it that way if you allow the Lord. Now, let's talk about this. I want you all to look at Peter and them first. Go to John 1. When we talk about surrendering unto the Lord, don't ever get the idea of goal setting that you're heading towards this. That ain't it. No, you can't do that. That's like a person, you know, they'll say, hey, me and Chris joke all the time, we're going to start a new diet. Every time we start a new diet, this coming today, we're going to blow it, isn't it? It always happens. But each time I'm foolish enough to think this time I'm going to, right? I'm not, look, I'm, I know that's, that's insanity. You keep doing the same thing, and right? But what dietitians will say is don't go on a diet, change your eating habits. Now, I don't understand that. That's the same to me, but that's what they say, isn't it? Well, in other words, instead of setting this lofty goal and I'm setting off to get, no, Minute by minute, day by day, we're going to have to have our habits kind of change. And don't make this about your sins. This ain't about your sins. This is about submitting to the Lord's leadership. Now watch with this man here. There's four of them. This is in John the Baptist ministry, verse 35. <clears throat> John 1, 35. Again the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples. So here's two men that have been baptized by John. So right away, what have they admitted? They're sinners and they publicly washed themselves. We failed under Moses' law. It says, Looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And they say, Well, nobody knew what Jesus was. Well, he sure knew, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be, say, being interpreted, Master. So to them, what is he? Master, a real good teacher. Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So we've got Andrew and Peter, a set of brothers, and James and John. And this is who we're dealing with. Now watch what Andrew does. 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon. And saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now notice what he thinks. He thinks he found the Messiah. Folks, anybody, when you first got saved, what did you think? We think we found salvation, don't we? And as you come to learn the Word of God more and more, what starts to happen? You begin seeing, wait a minute, he did this, I didn't do it. He thinks he's found the Messiah. Now, I love what Andrew did. Folks, Andrew was a soul winner, you could say. What did Andrew immediately do when he found the Messiah? He run and told his family, didn't he? We do the same thing, don't we? What's the result, generally speaking? He, you know, Jesus said when a person come to him, it would divide houses. Three against two and two against three. In my experience, it's 14 against one. That's the truth. You, you, this is not a uniting thing, is it? And you say, well, you really lost 14? Yeah, I, seriously, I could say that. But you know what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh-oh. And if I count all my classes, I bet I've received tenfold. You see, we've got brothers and sisters, real brothers and sisters. So he goes and gets his brother. Now they go and find him. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. And when he uh, saw him, he said, Thou art Simon. The son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now please look at this statement. He said, thou art Simon. Why don't we draw Simon down here? Now Simon means hearing. And so far all he's done is heard, right? Where does faith come from? Hearing. hearing. But if you trace the word out, I've heard this several times and I never could, never could... And this morning I was looking at it, and ah, oh, there it is, okay. The root that, it's, it's Simeon in the Old Testament, it's Shemai, but anyway, to make a long story short, Simon comes from a word that means shaky. Like, you say hearing, and what they suggest is when we hear something, what's actually going on in the ear? A little vibration, right? 
But the word Simon means wobbly, unsteady, shaky. Uh, you standing on wet sand. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. That's the idea. So old Simon here is shaky. But what did he just tell him he would be? Rock. Stone. Rock. Stone. Did he say, thou art now, or thou shalt be? Shall be. So what's he going to transform Simon into? A stone. A stone. Mm -hmm. Now they begin calling him Peter by faith, but he wasn't no stone, was he? Mm -hmm. But what does he expect to be? Rock. Rock. Okay, now watch. <clears throat> He's just told him that. I would think that from this moment forward, Peter is going to follow him with un unbridled passion. Wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. I thought when I got saved, that's it. I am going to serve the Lord. He, I, I got to, I, Look, I saw I wanted to preach the gospel and the Lord let me and I thought this is it. I'm going to serve Him with unbridled passion. Baloney. Mm -hmm. It ain't never happened. I, I desire to in little bits and spurts, but I've never accomplished it. But I do believe the Lord will continue working towards that because He said He would. Now, he just called him, and, and there's everybody sees it, right? This is only in John, this particular telling of it. Now, take that and go over to uh, Matthew 4. Now, didn't they think they had found the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Y'all think about us when we get saved. Is there anything that more, more, ought to be more important to us than the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. And yet our lives take first precedent. We can't help it. Our physical lives and the world around us is so strong that even though we know that we're going to die and stand before the Lord, it's like a, the reason credit cards are so popular, I suspect, is buy now and pay later. Mm -hmm. We think that was those way. Well, I'll, get, I'll worry about that down the road, right? Folks, watch what Peter does. This is mind-boggling if you think about it. Did he just meet the Messiah? Yes. Did the Messiah say, come? Yes. Okay. Now you would say, well, if Jesus said it, then it ought to happen. Well, he followed him a little, didn't he? Watch where we find him in verse 18 of chapter 4. Now this is later. This is not the same event. This is later. Verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. People would have you believe this is the first time Jesus ever saw these men, but it's not. He's already known them. They've already followed him one time. What are they doing here? They're going back fishing, hadn't they? Yeah. You can say whatever you want. Somebody said, well, was it wrong for them to go back fishing? I ain't saying it's wrong or right. I'm telling you this is what they're doing. Right? So they're back fishing. He saith unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Then at the first following, were they made fishers of men? No. Then this is going to be an ongoing process, isn't it? If we'll all get in our mind that this is a process, it's not an event. It's a process. What is your life? A process. It's a process. How did it start? Birth. It started at conception. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't yeah. it? And then it birthed. And then infancy, childhood, and top. Is it still going on? Yeah. It is, isn't it? He, my granny, she only went through fifth grade. I think she started sixth, but she. But I can honestly tell y'all, she was the wisest old bird I've ever met. Man just had horse sense, right? She told me one time after I had uh, uh, just fouled my life up completely, and I was sitting at her table talking to her, and she said, "Well, I'm gonna tell you." Unfortunately, we spend about the first 40 years learning. She said, if only we could have a second life to put into action all the things we learned in that first life. Amen. Ain't that the truth? Yes. This is an ongoing thing, isn't it? How does, a, how does a child of God come into existence? It starts with a seed. Yeah. Did you ask for the seed? Somebody find me an infant that asked to be born. You don't ask to be born. You're conceived and you're brought into the world. Well, a person that finally uh, comes to the birth canal spiritually, what do we call it? Born again. What did Paul say they are? Babes. You know what Paul called himself later on? Paul, an old aged elder. A wise old bird. Wise in this world? Wise in the Lord. Was he wise in the Lord the first day? No. Then is this a process? Okay. Now watch. He says to them, go, verse 20. They straightway left their nets and followed him. So now there's the second time they've dropped everything and followed him. Now look at where they were. It says they were casting a net into the sea. 
doesn't it? Just the two of them. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now take that and go over to Luke 5. And again, if you just read these as being parallel stories, we're going to miss a lot. But if you'll read the God, anybody ever, y'all like to read the Gospels like in harmony? Do y'all have a harmony in the Gospels? I tell you what, I'll print one and have them for y'all, okay? And look, this is nothing, uh, I didn't invent this. This has been around for 2,000 years. All it is, is it's a chart, and it shows you, it starts at John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and it takes you chronologically through the Gospels. So all you do is you read down through them in, in the order, as the, and what happens is you'll see a lot of events that you thought were the same. Hey, did anybody here ever preach the same thing twice? Yeah. If you come to, a lot of times, if you come here on Wednesday night, there's somebody here, two people here that are suffering through a message for the second time. Because a lot of times I'll practice it at routes. So then what happens is I say a lot of the same things in Grand Bay that I've already said at Pensacola. Jesus Christ made a lot of the same statements over and over. But the setting here is totally different. Watch Luke 5, verse 1. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, a while ago, he just walked by two men casting their nets and called them, didn't he? Mm -hmm. This is later. As a matter of fact, this is quite a bit later. It says, he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. The first time they were in the boat casting them, weren't they? Mm -hmm. What have Peter and his brother done? They've gone back to fishing again, haven't they? Folks, y'all see a, a man here that's on shaky ground? Yeah. This is a jellyfish, isn't it? <laughs> this man is, is the old term is wishy-washy. I could just take Peter there and strike that through and put Troy. Look, I, this is me. Now it says, He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. I love that he... Uh, Prayed Simon to thrust out a little bit. Simon, take a baby step. Come on. You know, at the end of this ministry, Simon jumps out and walks on the water, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Here he's got a coaxing to push out a little bit. Now he says, verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Little step. Now let's take it a step further. Let's go out into the deep. Now think about Simon, a fisherman. And what's the Lord sending him to do? catch fish from where the deep do y'all know what the bible says men who are in religion i don't mean look when i say religion i don't mean every church out there is i don't that i don't know what every church out there teaches that that ain't what i do know is this what does the bible call a religion of works it says men that are in a religion of works are in a snare and they're caught in a pit Guess what the word there for deep is? It's the same. Well, you go out and we're, we're out into the deep, right? Now next he says, Simon answering said unto him, Master, still calling him Master, isn't he? We have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Now there's the perfect picture of a man in religion. We have toiled all this time and have gained nothing. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah. It's the same with the man that had been infirm 38 years. Had anybody at the temple ever helped him? Had he profited at all? Mm -hmm. That you could just keep going through this. All the years I spent confessing and repenting and mumbling over beads, did it do anything for me? Nope. Not a lick. Not one thing. Now he says next, We have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Here's the first little instance of a little exhibiting of a little bit of faith. Well, I know I'm not going to have any luck here, but I'll go ahead and do it. I, I remember first started preaching, and that's exactly how it felt. Every time I would go to, to preach somewhere, I would think the same thing. Well, I know I'm going to fail here, and this ain't going to work. And Well, with that attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but Peter says, we'll give it a try. Now there's something else to notice. Were they able to catch a single fish without the Lord? No. Then who really put them on these fish? The Lord. The Lord did. He, if y'all don't know me and Wayne and Chris, this makes good sense. Put me on them. Right? Mm -hmm. I could say to Chris, Chris say, I said, how'd y'all do? We Put me on them. What am I telling Chris? 
Show me where they're at. Give me the spot. Where you got it at? Is there a marker? Tell me where to go, right? Mm -hmm. Put me on them. Every person that has ever been saved, the Lord took somebody else and put him on them. Mm -hmm. The Lord does the work, not us. Right. And he says next, I'll, At thy word I'll let down the net. When they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net breaker. Folks, they caught so many, a great multitude. Do you know where that great multitude shows up the last time? Standing before the throne of God over there in Revelation, don't they? He said, their net break. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Can you imagine that? He, you know, I have been in mullet so thick. You, people think it's a... a you tell this to a regular bunch and it's a old fish story. Wayne and Chris can verify. Mullet will jump in the boat. And yes, you'll get in them so thick you have got to quit them or you can't. They will. They'll get in the boat. And it hurts when they hit you, doesn't it? All right. But um, they fill this thing up to the boat's going to sink. Yeah. I mean, are they totally dependent on the Lord here? They're out in the deep in a boat, right? Yeah. Next verse. When Simon Peter saw it, there's what it always takes to get a little faith in the Lord. we got to see Him work, don't we? When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me. I am a sinful man, O Lord. He ain't master anymore, is he? O Lord. What did it take for Peter to see how sinful he was? Look what he's been doing. Has he followed the Lord like he should have? He's gone back to fishing and did he have any luck? No. He, a fella told me one time, he said, uh, once you get saved, he said, you preach the gospel. When you first start preaching, things are so, uh, uh, it could be so hard at first. And it, it, there's other times, it, but it could be so hard at first that your natural inclination is to think, well, I guess I'm just going to go back to doing such and such, right? And when you start thinking that way, a fella told me, he said, well, you can go back to doing that. But you're going to be miserable. That's probably very true. I didn't go back to doing it, but I bet I'd have been miserable. Oh, Peter here has just seen something. He saw not only did I not follow the Lord the way I should have, not only did I have zero faith, that even after seeing the things he had done, when put to the test right there on the moment, I didn't think I'd catch any fish. He still didn't trust him. What did that make him say about himself? I'm nothing. Remember last time we talked about I must decrease, he must increase. Now it says, verse 9, For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of fishes which they had taken. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me. They were astonished at the Lord's ability to catch fish. There's me. I get astonished when I see the Lord do something that he said he would do. Astonished. Y'all ever hear people will talk about prayer gets answered and we'll talk about it like it's some amazing, astonishing thing, won't we? Mm -hmm. And other people will hear it like, and all it is is unbelief. You say, well, then he really does answer prayer. Well, he said to pray, didn't he? Mm -hmm. hey, Y'all remember those folks in Acts? Peter got locked up and thrown in jail, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And it says the disciples went back to Mary, the mother of Mark's house, and they were all praying for Peter, weren't they? Yeah. And what happens? Angel Lord gets Peter out. Peter comes and knocks on the door where they're all praying for Peter, right? Yeah. And the young girl comes to the door and says, Oh my goodness, it's Peter. She runs back in the house and she said, It's Peter, it's Peter. And what did everybody tell her? You crazy. <laughs> A bunch of believers now. You're crazy. Did they believe the prayer was going to be answered? No. It's amazing the Lord got Peter out with that kind of praying, isn't it? Well, here Peter says... He was, it says he was astonished. He couldn't believe what the Lord had done. We ought never be astonished at the ability of the Lord. Folks, the Lord can do anything. Now next he says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now notice that. He said, you will be a catcher of men. Now he said, from henceforth. How many times did it take Peter to even follow the Lord? Three times. You reckon he's done abandoning? Now read the Gospels. The night they come to get Jesus, what does he do? He denied him three times, didn't he? You say, well, yeah, but that's uh, after... Uh, watch what verse 11 says. 
when they uh, had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Okay, there's their so-called unconditional surrender, isn't it? Go to John 21. The reason I'm wanting to do this is because I'm wanting to show y'all what an unstable fleshly individual the Apostle Peter was. If you read it, you'll find out the same about Paul, about John, about all of them. Well, then you know that nothing different going to be about you. Then don't get discouraged in your failures. Turn to the Lord. Folks, we're going to fail. A father puts a child on a bike, a little bike, a kid, and he pushes him off without the training wheels. What does the father know? He's going to fall. Everybody in here has probably had scraped knees, hadn't we? Did the Lord abandon, or did your father abandon you because you fell off the bike? No. That's part of the learning process, isn't it? That's what this life's about. Now watch what happens in Luke 21. Um, Alright, Jesus has just uh, appeared to John 21, I'm sorry. John 21, Jesus has appeared unto them, and uh, they, they've seen them, and he told them in verse... Uh, in chapter 20, he told them, receive the Holy Ghost, and they got the Holy Ghost, didn't they? But I want y'all to see what they do next. What did Jesus tell them to do? Wait in a room for him. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Watch this. John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On this why showed he himself. In other words, here's the story. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, that means a twin, and Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that's uh, James and John, and two others, his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, after the resurrection and after receiving the Holy Ghost, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. What has this man just done again? He's going right back. Wishy washy. Wishy washy. <laughs> He, you know, it's like a. I had a dog, Otis, and he was a white English bulldog. This, the best dog I ever had. And this joker was so smart. I mean, he was just unbelievable. We'd clean him and wash him, and he, it just, and you let him outside, you know what he'd do? He'd go find the dirtiest thing he could and get in it. Now, do you think that, that when he did that, I'd have stopped loving him? No. Well, I'm not suggesting that you and I go do that. I'm suggesting that's what you and I do. Okay, I'm not telling you let's go do that. I'm telling you let's be aware that that's what we do. Even when we don't get physically dirty. We study the Word of God and then we, in our minds, wallow around in filthy places, don't we? Now, he's gone back fishing, so watch what happens. Verse 3. Simon tells him he's going to go fishing. And they say, we go with thee. Look at the effect that a wishy-washy believer can have on those around him. Can't they? It says, they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Why aren't they catching anything? Out of the will of the Lord. They're out of the will of the Lord. Thank you, Mr. Out of, out of the will of the Lord. You go out there and preach outside the will of God. You might make converts to your doctrine, but you won't teach anybody about Jesus Christ. Folks, you can go out there and teach a doctrine and you can get a huge following if that's what you're wanting, but teach the truth and it'll be just the opposite. And he says, verse 4, When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. What has their turning from him done? They don't even recognize him. Me and you turn from God. We get out of the will of God. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our conscience. And we don't even recognize him. Somebody, I'm not talking about some audible voice. The Holy Spirit works through this book calling things to your mind. So what are we told to do? Study this book. And when you study it, you input the data, and what is the he, he calls the thoughts of that? But when we turn from him, those thoughts arise, and we just think it's my, you know, some, oh, it's just my other, you know, consideration. Or we do this ridiculous thing with the God on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder, competing for our affections. Baloney. That's that's a bunch of bull. Don't ever buy that. Now he says next verse five. Then Jesus saith unto them, children. Why y'all reckon he called them that? That's what they are, little babes. Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. Now, didn't he know the answer? Yeah. Why did he ask them? So they, so they would recognize it. So in other words, they're sitting there and they think, hmm, we've done all this to no avail, right? 
verse 6. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, probably John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. They just remembered the Lord, didn't they? Mm -hmm. We talked a few classes back about turning back to the Lord when we get out of the will of God. This is a perfect example. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now he did not lose his imputed righteousness, but had he stripped himself of the ability to yeah. serve Christ. Yeah. You cannot serve two masters. And that don't look, don't make this some life-changing moment when you decided to serve one or the other. Make this every single breath you take. You cannot serve two masters. We're either going to do the things that we know are God's will, or we're going to do what's our will, and there ain't no in-between. Now, what we usually do is this. We know a thing is God's will, but we have an incredible desire to do this other thing. So, this man, the old man, begins to speak to the new man to try and convince the new man that it's God's will to do the thing the old man wants to do. Now, that's the kind of conversation I often think of myself. Lexi keeps Wyatt and Kinsley, and they come over here, and I like to listen to them play when they don't know anybody's listening. A lot of times I'll be studying or something, and I can hear them and the things they say. And I'll hear Wyatt devise a plan, and it's always for his benefit. But then he's going to convince Kinsley to go along with him. And I listen and sit there and think, that is the, is she really going to believe that? What he did say? And she'll fall for it. You know, that's me. Folks, I can convince myself that the craziest things are God's will. And yet, when it's all said and done, I ain't fooling nobody. I certainly ain't fooling the Lord. And in all reality, I ain't fooling me. I knew what I was doing. I go to God in prayer many times. I'm, I'm ashamed to tell y'all, but this is the truth. In prayer, I pray to God about things and I purposely avoid other things because I don't want to bring them up to God. Now, I hate that. And I hope that changes. I pray to the Lord that He, he continues to, to flush that stuff out. But it's there. And I suspect it will be there right until the day I leave this earth. But Peter says here, uh, they find out it's him. Peter's naked. He cast himself into the sea. Verse 8, the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they then were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. As soon as they turned back to the Lord, what did he do? He fed them. Now, y'all think that's what me and you do. We turn from the Word of God, and God quits feeding us His Word. Until we turn back to God with a submitted will, you can study, but you ain't going to get nothing out of it. You might come up with some beautiful things to impress people with what you know, but you won't get anything from the Lord. Folks, the Lord doesn't feed us when we turn away from Him. I've told y'all many times about the man that wrote his Bible. When he died, they found it written in his Bible. This book will keep you from sin. Well, that's a fact. He said, but sin will keep you from this book. Y'all know what it is to avoid it. Y'all know good and well what it is. You think about whenever the times come when you're not studying or you're not interested in the things of the Lord, or you don't even feel like you're serving the Lord, and go back and ask yourself, when did this start? And I guarantee you it started at some exact sin. Now, I'm not telling y'all we're going to reach sinless perfection. That ain't what I mean. What I mean is, as soon as I turn away from God's leadership and follow my own leadership, He's done leading me in that thing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Until I turn back to Him and acknowledge I've gone astray, I ain't going to get the leadership back. Y'all all seen a parent ignoring a child, haven't you? Mm -hmm. he, uh, I heard a, a, a guy telling a story, and it was just such a great example. It made an impact on me. He said a little girl come in and said, Hey, uh, what do you want me to do about such and such, Daddy? And he said, Now you take this and you go do that. And she said, But I, what if I do this? He said, You take this and you go do that. And she sat there with, well, Daddy, could we do this and that? And said he never said another word. Finally, the mom heard all the talking and come in there and said, What's going on? And the little girl said, Daddy's ignoring me. And he said, I most certainly am not ignoring you. Now tell the truth. And she just sat quietly. He said, The truth is, I gave you a command and you don't want to follow it. I've already spoken, enough said. 
Ain't that how the Lord ought to do? It is what the Lord does. We know what His will is when we see it in His book, and yet what do me and you do? We don't want to follow it. Okay, now let's go back over here to John chapter uh, 20, verse 30. Now John wrote all these things for many purposes. One of them is so you and I can see how we do in the Lord. Now there's a great example of this in Abraham. If we went back here and we looked at Abraham, God calls Abraham, doesn't he? Does Abraham obey him? Half-hearted. He comes out, but who's he bring with him? His father and Lot, right? He's supposed to separate. So he starts kind of obeying him, and then what do you find him? He gets a little hungry, so he's back in Egypt instead of trusting the Lord. It. I should be doing this. So he starts to follow and he's back in Egypt. Then the Lord appears to him and imputes him righteous, doesn't he? Abraham's on the top of the mountain with the Lord, imputed righteous. And what's he do next? He sleeps with Hagar. And then God straightens that situation all out and gives him the covenant of circumcision. He ascends an even higher mountain, doesn't he? And then where does he go? He goes back down and sells his wife. Y'all see Abraham's life? That's what life's like, isn't it? Each time Abraham ascended a higher plateau in his relationship with God, how far was the fall? It was farther. Look, if I fall from the, my position in these slippers, I ain't going to hit the floor very hard, am I? What if I crawl up on the roof? Yeah. yeah. See? So then those that fall in society are the ones that we've lifted up the most, fall the hardest, don't they? Well, the clearest manner to keep your old man from falling is don't lift him up. Right now, what about when we get lifted up in the Lord? He can, away. He can sustain that. He can, he can keep you in that position. What's the only way you can fall from that position? You're going to have to turn and take a step off in the other direction. And this is what we do. This is the process. But watch what John says in verse 30, chapter 20. He's, he's built this book around seven signs, and in verse 30 he says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that, now that means in order that, because, so, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So if you know a lost person and they tell you that they need to read the Bible, where would you tell them to start? A lot of folks would say Romans, and that would be a good place for a saved person to start. Yeah. It would be the best place for a lost person that yeah. doesn't. It be John. John's written for, now y'all think about what verse is the most well-known verse in the world. John 3.16. And people say, well, that's not for us. Come on now. God so loved the world. Does it say God so loved the Jews? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, the reason John 3.16 can be taken by men to say that's only for Israel, it's not for us, is because they read it out of context. Flip back over there. John 3. Verse 12. He said, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, that's kind of like the person that goes and reads uh, Ephesians and doesn't uh, know John. And I don't mean that you've got to do this in order. Look, you can get saved out of Ephesians just like any other book. But in general, how could you ever understand the things of Jesus Christ if you don't know Jesus Christ from his uh, own ministry? Right now, watch what he says next. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Well, out the window went Elijah, didn't it? Elijah didn't go up. No man hath ascended. Even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now verse 14 says, And as, as means in the same manner, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. 
But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, people will tell you that a man is on equal playing ground, and if he denies Christ, he's condemned. If he believes Christ, he's saved. That's what we just had in the example of God on one shoulder and the devil on the other, competing, right? Baloney. How are all men born? Condemned. condemned. What's used in the scripture to refer to the masses of humanity? The sea. The restless sea. What's in the sea? Fish. Y'all think about the Lord Jesus Christ up here letting down his hook and pulling these fish out one at a time. Because that's what the Lord's doing. And you know what he uses for bait? His word. His word through some old sinful hook. He takes a line and he drops it down. Some old sinner like a worm is crawling around on the hook and doing what? Attracting somebody. Now that worm doesn't really even want to be in the situation, but the Lord's using him, isn't he? Now think about how this is going to work. He said as Moses was lifted up the serpent, Jesus Christ would be lifted up. Now he said this before the cross. Now how in the world could a, a pole, Moses took a pole and put a snake on the pole, didn't he? Now who did the Lord Jesus Christ just say that snake was a picture of? himself. He, a lady got so mad at me a while back, she got up and left the class over this. Somebody said, a serpent can't possibly represent Jesus Christ. He just said it did, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at the story, we'll get the picture. They're traveling through the wilderness, and God sends fiery flying serpents in among them. I don't know what that is, but I believe it. And they started biting them, didn't they? And so then what started happening? They started dying. What was killing them? Snake bite. They had poison in their bloodstream, didn't they? Once you're bit, that's it. Now imagine you're out there in the wilderness. Look, if I got bit right now, my first reaction would be, who, who's going to suck on my leg, right? I've seen enough John Wayne movies to know that's what I need. Well, I bet I have a hard time convincing any of y'all. You think about it. Suck on your leg? No, I see you. I see you at the pearly gates, right? <laughs> but think about what's going on. I would be looking for a remedy, wouldn't I? My next thing would be, well, I've got to get to the hospital. Would one of y'all give me a ride? I can't drive. I said, Chris, can you give me a ride? He said, i got lunch plans. <laughs> I said, look, right? And I don't know. I say, Wayne, you go, well, me and Chris are going to go over to such and such. I'd like to bring you, but I can't. And I said, well, Dina, please bring me over. See what I'm doing? I'm looking around for some earthly cure, ain't I? What did God tell Moses to do out there? Take a pole. And put a brass, brass represents judgment in the Bible. And put a brass serpent on the pole. You lift the pole up and you tell the people, anybody that'll stop trying to fix the problem, that'll stop looking for the earthly solution, and will just look at that pole, I'll save them. And so Moses did it. He put a serpent on a pole, he lifted it up. But the only way that those people could be saved from the poison that was in their bloodstream... What did they have to do? Look. To look at the snake, what did they first have to do? They had to stop looking at that. That's right. Get your mind off the circumstances and look at the snake, right? Now, how's a person get saved today? You've got to quit looking at your circumstances and quit looking for the solution, and you've got to look to Christ on the cross. Now, how could a serpent represent Jesus Christ? A brass serpent of all things. What did brass, I just said, represents a judgment? Jesus Christ said He'd come into the world not to judge the world, but what? Save. 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 He died. He became judged for us. There's your brass. He was judged in your place. Imagine those that won't even believe on Him, and yet He was judged for them. That's him. Yeah. Folks, the man that stuck them thorns in His temple... Jesus is looking at him. Is he about to die for that man? Yeah. How about the one that hammered the nails laughing at him? Was yeah. he dying for him? Yes. How about the guy that spit in his face? Yes. Yes. How about me and you yes. that have done worse? Yes. All right. Now y'all think to who much is committed, much more is expected. That old pagan Roman had no idea who he was nailing up there. But boy, I sure know who I'm disobeying when I disobey him. I got that whole book right there. Now, 
as he's nailed up there in judgment, how does a snake come into the picture? Who does that snake represent? Sin. How did sin enter into the human race? Through the work of the serpent, didn't it? Sin. Jesus Christ was sin on the cross. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5.18 says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled. Now what tense is that? Yes. So then whatever needed to be done is already done, right? Yes. Do you need to pray to God to do something, or do you need to believe in what He's already done? Believe it. He said, He hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Then everything that needed to be done for reconciliation has already been done. And who was it done by? Christ. Jesus Christ. What part do you play in that? Yeah. Because you don't have a part. All you can do is believe it. So he says, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Is a ministry supposed to be about uh, bribing people for money? No. Is it supposed to be about uh, handing out so-called gifts and languages and spat? No. Mm -hmm. What's a ministry about today? Reconciliation. What's the um, um, ambassador sent with a message, isn't he? What message are we supposed to be preaching? Reconciliation. How are you going to preach reconciliation without preaching the cross? You can't. Now you can preach the cross without preaching reconciliation, but you can't preach reconciliation without the cross. Now he says next, to wit, here's the message. Watch. God was in Christ. That speaks to his deity, doesn't it? Reconciling the world. How many does that include? All. Does that mean all of them are saved? Um, no. no. Does it mean he died for all of them so that all could be saved? Yes. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Why is God not charging the trespasses to the world? He charged them to his son. Folks, he would be denying his son if he denied you. Look, you've been put in a position today, all of us, whereby if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God doesn't save you, God is unrighteous. He can't deny you if you believe on the Lord without denying his son. He said, whosoever, right? Next verse. Or, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So he gave us a ministry of reconciliation and gave us the words to preach. Verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. There's your worm on the hook. God's doing the fishing. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Now he did everything that needed to be done to reconcile us to him. Right? Yeah. What do we have to do? Believe. You've got to believe the reconciliation. Let's say me and Mr. Al get in a fight. And boy, we fall out and, and Mr. Al, we separate and we don't speak for 50 years. We, we're high school kids and boy, we just, we're done. 50 years later, I get a letter from Mr. Al telling me, I'd like to get together. And, and I said, oh no, I remember what I did you. And he said, oh no, don't worry about that. I've reconciled that. Don't worry about that. We're still good friends, right? And yet I say, I don't know, that sounds like a trap. He's inviting me for dinner. Sounds like he's going to poison me. Has Mr. Al reconciled in his mind? Yes. Then what's keeping us from reconciliation? Yeah. I don't believe it. You see what Jesus Christ did? You see what humanity does. Now here's the verse 21. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, and it doesn't mean God forced him to do it. This is made as a creative act. Something actually transpired here. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So then did God make Jesus Christ to become our sin? Yes. You see how the serpent represented him then? I want you to ask yourself one question before you leave today. Do you have complete peace about your situation with God. Because yeah. if you don't have peace about your standing in Christ, ask God why not. The reason you would not have peace would be because you've not accepted the peace that God has offered. Your peace can never be peace as long as it depends in any form on your performance. 
Now, y'all think about that again. You will never have peace with God as long as it is relying on your performance in any way. Because what do we all know about our performance? We fail, don't we? So either the Lord Jesus Christ did everything, and I'm going to just trust completely what He did, or I'll go right to hell where I deserve to go. And in hell, all I'll be able to say to the Lord is, this is what I brought on myself, because I'm a sinner. Okay? Are there any questions? All right, thank you all very much.